Welcome to another exciting video about the fossil record. My name is Ben Schoenberger, and in this video, I wanted to uh, examine the fossil record of everyone's favorite pet, the hamster. In particular, the golden hamster, Mesochrysetus oratus. The evolution and radiation of hamsters is interwoven with the history of the rodents. The order Rodentata includes the greatest number of living species of mammals today. But during the early Cenozoic, with the recent demise of the dinosaurs, the rise of the rodents and hamsters was not certain. In fact, they were in the minority. Many other mammalian groups were highly successful during the uh, early radiation just after the collapse of the tyrannical dinosaurs. So during the early uh, Paleocene, the ancestor of early rodents were particularly rare and only found in Asia. These early Paleocene rodent ancestors were so primitive that they would also give rise to rabbits, bunnies, and pikas. Uh, together, the rodents and the rabbits form a group called glieries. One of the best known early rare proto-rodents was the Paleocene fossil Mimitona from China. The fossil exhibits characteristics of both rabbits, the Lagomorpha order of mammals, and the early rodents, or the Rodenta order. The skull of Mimitona features two lower incisors and two upper incisors in each side of the uh, mouth. This places it within the Dupliaci dentidae, or the duplicate teeth, with modern rabbits and pikas who also have two incisors in each jaw. Now, Mimitota may have also been the ancestor of rodents as well because rodents are characterized by having only one paired incisor in the upper and lower parts of the mouth. This is referred to as the simplicy dentidae, or the simple teeth. The earliest fossil that shows the simple teeth configuration is the small fossil from the late Paleocene of China called Sin Mylius. This tiny fossil features a single upper incisor and a teeny tiny or maybe absent first premolar and tiny second premolar and larger third and fourth premolars as well as all three molars. A space exists between the incisor and these posterior teeth called a diastema and both rabbits and rodents have a diastema including hamsters. This character helps define the Glieries group, which lost the canine teeth sometime in the early Paleocene. One of the first groups of the Sim Simplici dentidae to evolve was the Eurymylidae, um, a family of very primitive uh, rodent ancestors that lost the first and second premolars with a strong or big set of five premolar uh, and molar teeth in the upper jaw and five premolar and molar teeth in the lower jaw. The most famous of the Eurymylidae is Rhombomylus from Asia. Now, some of these fossils show double layers of enamel for strengthening the teeth for eating uh, grasses and harder seeds, which will later be expanded upon. Now the Eurymylidae are placed outside of rodents since they still retain five premolar molar teeth in each of the lower jaws. The rodents, true rodents, lose the third premolar and have only four uh, lower premolar and molar teeth in each of the lower jaws. The first true rodents are the primitive A. Lagomyidae. Um, and the highly successful and more diverse Ishkaramyidae, which are found in the final days of the Paleocene, but quickly diversified in the early Eocene. Now, both Ishkaramyids and Alagomyids um, are 
found in their native Eurasian continent, but they made it over into North America about 56 million years ago, where their first appearance defines the Clark Forkian age of the late Paleocene epoch. However, both families are rare in the fossil record until things went all crazy, climatically speaking. The Paleocene-Eocene boundary was the most defining moment of these early rodents. A massive global warming event called the PETM led to the massive deforestation, which reduced forest habitats for many of the arboreal mammals living at the time. These early rodents were more terrestrial, and they actually survived the events very successfully because they were more of a generalist and they had a high reproductive strategy. The revegetation of the continents with forests after the global warming event in the earliest Eocene resulted in a profound faunal shift um, as rodents quickly became the dominant group edging out the Mesozoic holdovers, the multi-tuberculates, who became the rare group and eventually went extinct in the early Eocene. The abundant Ishkaramayid rodents demonstrate a cranial anatomy, um, particularly the zygomatic plate that is expanded, aligning them with the scuriomorph rodents. And ancestor to squirrels, prairie dogs, and marmots, as well as beavers and pocket gophers. While another group of early rodents exhibit the hystricomorph condition, where the medial masseter muscle, which closes the jaw, passes through the infraorbital foramen, or hole in the cheekbone. This arrangement is found in porcupines, South American rodents like guinea pigs and chinchillas, uh, as well as in African uh, phytomorpha, such as cane rats. The condition is also found in the diapodidae, the, uh, the gerbils and the jumping mice, uh, the ancestors of which uh, begin to appear in the Middle Eocene. Hamsters belong to a third group uh, that exhibit the mylomorph condition. Now the mylomorph condition uh, is kind of in between the scuriomorph condition and the hystricomorph condition. Uh, there is a zygomatic plate uh, that's enlarged for the lateral masseter muscle. It's just not as big as that found in the scuriomorph condition. And there is a infraorbital foramen for passage of the uh, medial masseter muscle. It's just not as big and large as you find in the hystricomorph condition. The most successful of the myomorph rodents are the superfamily Miradira which includes mice and rats, as well as hamsters. One of the earliest members of this group is the Middle Eocene fossil Nitomes, a member of the Eocene Scuraavidae family. They were smaller than the common squirrel-like Ishkaramayid rodents of the Eocene, and they exhibited a skull anatomy that was more similar to the myomorph condition. They resemble modern mice and are rare in the fossil record, likely due to their small size. The Scura avidae are likely candidates to the ancestral group of the superfamily Muridae, but they may have also given rise to South American rodents as well as various hystricomorph rodents as well. Another closely related Eocene family is the Cylindrodontidae, they begin to exhibit more lobes in their molars, which wear, when worn, into ridges rather than open basins. Because of this, the Middle Eocene Cylindrodontidae may prove to be more closely related to the superfamily Miridae. The superfamily Miridea uh, includes a huge group of mice and rats but also gerbils, voles, lemmings, and muskrats. The group arose during the late Eocene and ranged across Eurasia and North America. With the great cool down at the end of the Eocene during the Oligocene, ice sheets in Antarctica lowered sea level, allowing the group to spread into Africa 
including the island of Madagascar. The family Chrysi today first appeared during this time of cooling and geographic expansion. The oldest member in North America is Eumiles, which is well known from abundant fossils in the late Eocene and early Oligocene of North America. The family is characterized by losing the premolars in the lower and upper jaws, leaving only three molars. The molars are lobed shape, allowing for more grinding surface. It kind of resembles some of the changes that were occurring with the hooved mammals at the same time. As the diet shifted from fruits and nuts uh, found in dense forests to grasses and seeds that were found in grasslands as the climate cooled and opened up during the Oligocene epoch. The family Chryseidae is highly successful today, particularly in North America, including common field mice or deer mice, uh, pack rats, and the carnivorous grasshopper mice. The group also invaded South America during the Great American Interchange at the end of the Miocene epoch. Early members of the group are found across Asia, and it was actually in Asia Minor that a particular group evolved that would become the hamsters. All of these mice-like mammals exhibit molars that have various complex lobes or wear surfaces that allow them to eat tough grasses and seeds uh, found in the more open grassland environments. And it was in the Asian steppes that some additional changes started to occur as the climate got even colder during the late Miocene epoch. One group developed faster growing molars, which form highly angular grinding surfaces that work well to chew dried grasses stored for the harsh winter. This group became the Arvica colony, a family that includes the lemmings and voles. At 5.2 million years ago, they expand out of the Asian steppes into the tundra of the northern Arctic, and they suddenly appear in North America during the late Hemophilian age of the Miocene. This sudden appearance marks an important biostratigraphic marker in the rock record uh, during this time near the Miocene-Pliocene boundary. The other group stayed in the Asian steppes and never made it to North America um, preferring the warmer, more temperate climates. And this was the subfamily Chryseatine, which includes the hamsters. Now, hamsters range in the wild from Korea in the east to Belgium and France in the west. The group first appeared in the fossil record during the Miocene epoch, around 11 million years ago, and stayed within the Asian steppes of Eurasia, with only several fossils known from North Africa. So for most of their fossil record, they were happy to make a go of it in Eurasia. Today, there are all 18 living species. Most living hamsters are given common names associated with where they are found, such as the Tibetan dwarf hamster, the Mongolian hamster, the Chinese hamster, the European hamster, the Korean hamster, the Turkish hamster, and the Russian dwarf hamster, just to name a few. One genus, the golden hamsters, Mesocrichus, lives in Eastern Europe, Anatolia, and the Northern Middle East. The earliest fossils are found in the late Miocene of Greece during the Mesian episode, um, about six million years ago. These fossil hamsters witnessed one of the great geological events in Europe. The Mediterranean Sea during this period of time was cut off from the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, and with a drier climate and a few thousand years, the entire Mediterranean Sea evaporated, leaving behind a giant basin spotted with salt-rich lakes. 
This desiccation of the sea left massive thick deposits of salts across this wide basin, allowing these ancient hamsters to expand their ranges throughout the Middle East. However, the connection to the Atlantic Ocean reopened near Gibraltar around 5 million years ago, resulting in, in the dramatic flooding of this giant basin and the re-establishment of the Mediterranean Sea. On the banks of the sea was one particular species, Mesocrycus oritus, the Syrian hamster. How Mesocrycus oritus became a favorite pet is a fascinating story. The story begins in 1740 when a Scottish doctor by the name of Alexander Russell uh, was working in Aleppo, Syria. He was just fascinated with documenting everything that he witnessed in his journals, particularly the plants and animals and wildlife of the area. And when he returned back to Scotland, he published his journals as a book entitled The Natural History of Aleppo. The book was a success in the local bookstores, and in 1797, his brother, Patrick, who had also had a medical practice in Aleppo, published an updated edition, which described for the first time the occurrence of hamsters in the surrounding city. Now, Patrick Russell uh, thought that hamsters uh, were the same species as those found in Europe, and he did not name them a new species. But he did make a note uh, about how hamsters stuffed copious amounts of fresh French beans into their cheek pouches, which were three times the bulk of their bodies. It was actually an Englishman who gave Syrian hamsters their scientific name. His name was George Robert Waterhouse, the curator of the Zoological Society in London. And in late 1836, uh, a huge collection of mammals had just arrived from a voyage around the world, which had been collected by a young uh, naturalist named Charles Darwin. It was his task to write a report documenting the mammals found during the voyage, uh, including very colorful plates illustrating the mammals. Now, George Robert Waterhouse, besides his interest in mammals, was also a well-known geologist, and he enjoyed studying fossils equally, later acquiring the famous archaeopteryx specimen for the museum. But as he was busy working on this report, a specimen of a hamster arrived from Aleppo, Syria, the skin of which was a lighter golden color, and it was smaller than specimens of hamsters from Europe. He named the species Oritus, which means golden in Greek, at a meeting of the Zoological Society in 1839, with the type specimen, a skin, housed at the Natural History Museum in London. Back in Syria, not much was known about the occurrence of hamsters, as they dug deep burrows and were much rarer than the common field mice. And when they were seen on the surface, they were viewed as being pests to crops. But they would become well known, due in part to a plague that was affecting the city of Aleppo. Uh, something called the Aleppo Boil that was first encountered by Alexander and Patrick Russell back in the 1750s in patients that they were treating. It's a horrible disease carried by tiny sand flies that bite people, infecting them with a parasite called Lesiomatheus. Now the disease is not fatal, but it causes horrible skin lesions or boils that are permanently disfiguring. In the 1930s, a scientist named Sal Alder was trying to find a cure for the disease by infecting Chinese hamsters with parasitic sand flies and treating various uh, medications on them. However, uh, Chinese hamsters are difficult to breed in captivity, and he was kind of curious if local hamsters from Aleppo, Syria, might help him find a cure. 
Alder sent the Russian-born naturalist Israel Apolloni to Aleppo to see if he could find some hamsters for the laboratory. Now, Israel Apolloni uh, was on friendly terms with the Sultan of Turkey, who he had been uh, supplying butterfly specimens for the Sultan's natural history collections. Now, in Aleppo, Apolloni worked with uh, uh, local farmers to dig up the wheat fields and look for golden hamsters. And he discovered a mother with a litter of babies. The single litter of babies was sent to the university where over a short period of time, generations of captive hamsters were bred. In the course of eight years, the university quickly was breeding several hundred hamsters, all from this single litter. And during this research, scientists began to discover a cure, a medication uh, that contains the metallic element um, antimonium called meglumite antimoniite, which is injected in the skin and muscle of the infected site and is still to this day a valuable cure for the disease. During the same time in the 1940s and 1950s, hamsters were exported to Europe and North America as pets. Many smuggled on board ships and planes, and new breeding colonies grew globally, particularly after World War II. From that one litter of hamsters, around 5 million hamsters live today in homes around the world. This fact amazed me when I was a kid raising hamsters of my own in my room and breeding them that a single litter from one mother uh, could result in the rapid population of hamsters found around the world as pets. If such events happen naturally in the fossil record where a single pregnant individual makes it to a new environment or new geographic region and finds success for her offspring, in just a matter of a few years, a thriving population could be found in that expanded region, resulting in the nearly instantaneous appearance of new species when examined in the fossil record. It is unknown if golden hamsters live today in the wild. The fate of the wild populations is unknown given the recent Syrian civil war and destruction of the city of Aleppo. Sporadic reports of wild hamsters have been mentioned in the 1970s, 1980s, but there's been no assessment of the wild populations that have been made. So today we are enriched by the golden hamsters that live in our homes today as beloved pets. The fossil record of hamsters highlights the interconnections of changing climates, adaptations, and the ability to save a species and cure a disease through scientific curiosity and a love for cute, cuddly hamsters. We should bestow the same dignity and charity to our fellow human beings. This month of December, I'm giving the modest proceeds of my YouTube channel to a charity that helps support dislocated people, uh, such as those affected by conflicts in Syria, Yemen, as well as those affected by climate change, such as the fires in California and the hurricanes and flooding in the Gulf Coast of the United States. If you want to learn more about the charity, uh, click on the link below in the description. I want to thank my Patreons, Brian Clever, Pablo Luzato Figuez, Arcotis1811, and Justin Bovey, and all my little Trilobite supporters for encouraging me to make these fun extra videos on the fossil record. If you'd like to learn how to support these videos, check out the link below. And let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos on the fossil record. Thanks for watching.